Tim. It's going to be a little <laughs> bit under. Thanks. Oh, under Thank you. Thank okay. you. Got it. All right. It's going to be a little underpowered right now. I've been fighting off a cold for the last week and a half. But I, um, I'm actually, um, I see some familiar faces, which is, which is nice. Um, so I'm a neighbor of, um, of Simon's. I'm across the street from Simon. And I'm an admirer of his painting, paintings, drawings, prints. I uh, major in art history at Williams, and then I studied uh, art at the uh, studio school, which is down on 8th Street, which was uh, taught by uh, faculty, which was uh, very much of the uh, New York school, people who had studied with Hoffman and Pollock. So it's very different kind of worlds, ways of thinking about visual arts. In fact, at one point, I was actually uh, working in the uh, Philip Gustin studio, where apparently he would smoke cigarettes and drink and think serious thoughts and do his paintings. So uh, there was an aura there, uh, an aura not unlike those of Simon's paintings. And, um, you know, one reason I uh, enjoy taking Simon's class, and, you know, sometimes I'm more in it than other times, depending on what's going on with the kids at home, uh, is because Simon, I think, belongs to that uh, tradition that Gustin belonged to, of a uh, a true modern who uh, is infatuated with the old masters and is somehow trying to bridge that gap between our culture, our visual culture, our psychological culture, and um, the culture that created those you know monuments of uh, of of art of artistry. And uh, I've always um, been very impressed by Simon's um, attention to, to the visual artifact and to uh, what would be considered, I, f I guess, a fairly traditional concept of art, which is that art is serious. It's the thoughts of an artist embodied in this, you know, surface. This work of art could be a sculpture, some, something two-dimensional, but it's you know, the, it's the artist's animating spirit as manifested through craft that creates this object that reverberates, hopefully, that has, you know, vibrations. And it's, you know, an intensive experience to try to, to engage. You know, it's not like a 10-second thing where you're looking at, you know, screenshots or you're going through a museum and just like looking at one thing, looking at another, looking at another. I mean, you really have to give it some seriousness because it demands that. And I think Simon, um, that's how Simon feels about art. And, uh, you know, sort of an oasis, you know, I really, really appreciate and uh, respect his sort of almost Talmudic intensity <laughs> of, uh, sort of visual hermeneutics. So, uh, yeah, so that's about all I have to say. But uh, I, I do enjoy the class and hearing everybody's point of view. I, uh, is, is there something that you have seen in the last four months, let's say? That... Yeah, I haven't been able to see that much. Um, but I would say two things that really struck me were the, uh, the Rick Barden show, which were uh, of the drawings. Did I have his right first name right? Oh, Rick Barton. Rick, Rick Barton. Bar yeah, right, Rick Barton. Yeah. Yes. Those are extraordinary. Uh, yes. You were talking about them a couple of classes ago. And um, I know it was a while ago, but the Holbein show. Yeah. Very yeah. different approach to, to visuality, but uh, both immensely um, compelling and uh, serious works that really uh, kind of blew me away. I mean, I expected to be blown away by Holbein. You know, he's always been yeah. a sort of hero of mine, but the Barden came as a total surprise. Yeah. Really uh, yeah. stunning work at, at so many levels. Um, thank you so much uh, for um, your, your introduction. I think it's, it gives everyone a take on you. And thanks for your very beautiful words addressed in my direction. Um, I hope you're right, and um, I'm betting I'm betting a lot that you're right. Uh, so, 
um, anyway, so so about uh, that, I'm right, Simon. What? what? <laughs> I'm right about that. I can't predict elections, but I'm right about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I want to do today is I want to continue where I left oh, with last God. week. And I have a question to ask you at the end of this of the program of, of the end of the the end of this uh, class tonight. I'm going to try my best to speed up, okay? Because um, I I don't I'm not sure how much I should speed up, but I I'll go a little faster than last week. So at the end of this class. If I still have more to go, I would like to know if you want me to stay with this or go to your input. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, I would stay with this. But if you feel like you want to try something different and you want to go for your essays and your input, I'm fine with that. Uh, this is maybe more work for me, but the funny thing about this is this is really weird. All of the class last week was improvised. I had no notes in front of me, zero notes. So if you watch the recording or if you were there, you couldn't see me, you just saw the images. All I had in front of me were the dates for the artists, but I had nothing else. It was just total improvisation. It's, it's a fascinating subject, and I didn't realize how much, how very much I'm interested in the subject until I did this. I was listening to myself, and I thought, wow, this really is saying something about something I'm interested in. And I've thought about this for quite a while, but I didn't kind of put it together. So in getting this grouping together, it really, I really learned about myself and about these artists. So I am enjoying this thoroughly and whichever way you decide is fine with me. So we could do a class three of this, or we could go to your, your input. In any case, class four would definitely be your input. So we'll do that at the end. So for now, let's go, Dean, let's go to where we were last week. Um, if you could put those images on, the three images. And I think we're, we're starting today with Celia Paul. Uh, who is number six. Okay, so what you have to do now is go to the right of your screen and at the very top part, you'll see um, a horizontal line. If you click that line, if you click Am I saying this right? If you click that line, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, do you see what I did? I just clicked that little horizontal line and now you see the three images. I know, okay. oh, okay. Okay. Wait a minute. So we're, we're, I don't know what this is, what's going on here. I, what I want is just those three images. Um, Celia Paul. Celia Paul. Oh, that's it. That's okay. it. That's okay. it. Okay. So yeah. I'm going to start here, and suppose I do five, and then I'll call for some questions or some input. Okay. So here we go. So this is the artist Celia Paul. Celia Paul, born 1959, still alive, born 1959 is a very, very good artist, English, and very moody, quite a number of self-portraits. These three 
are examples. Unfortunately, the one on the left is out of focus and I couldn't find anything better. The one in the middle is quite large. I think it's about seven feet high. The one on the right is quite small. Um, she also is a very fine writer. And um, I read one of her books. Uh, it's a, mem a memoir and it deals in part with Lucian Freud, uh -huh. it, but it, just in part. And Lucian Freud was her lover. Or, or to put it the opposite way, she was one of many lovers of <laughs> Lucian Freud. And um, she is included in a painting of his, which is going to be auctioned in November um, at, uh, I believe, Christie's. And it, I, I would try to see that painting. It's a painting of about four or five figures and she's I think on the far left so so this is Celia Paul so let's go to the next one so this is Matisse and Matisse's dates are 1869 to 1954 so the the painting in the middle um was the subject of an exhibit just recently at the Museum of Modern Art. And this is a stunning painting um, and deals with the theme of his studio, as does the one on the right, as does the one on the left. So in the one in the middle, he has painted out much of the detail that you might see. And the, the nature of that exhibit was that whoever, whoever thought of this was very clever, very audacious. They brought back in the same exhibit, every painting that is in this painting. So when you saw the painting at the Museum of Modern Art, you saw every single painting that is in this painting in quite a large room and that's it. That was the room. That was the exhibit. In the next room, they brought the painting on the left, which came from the Phillips collection. That painting is also a fantastic painting. And it's um, a little different than the one in the middle. Uh, very moody painting. And I believe if you travel to Washington, that's a painting that they would have up in Washington. Um, okay, next one. So now this is, this is Lucian Freud. And at the very far left in that painting is Celia Paul. Okay, so he has painted his lover in that painting. Now on the very far right, is Lucian Freud as an older man painting. And that painting on the far right is just stunning. Um, it's almost like um, Cervantes uh, painting of, right out of Cervantes, um, uh, like the Holy Fool, or um, it's just amazing, amazing painting. The one in the, the, what they all have in common here is they all have um, aspects of palettes, brushes, paint. So the one in the middle is a kind of conversation between the woman and the accoutrements of painting. In the one on the left, he has um, rearranged the hierarchy in painting from a male painting a woman right. to a woman painting a male, okay? It, it is, um, 
as in many works of Freud, it is in your face, disruptive and disorienting, okay? And, and wonderful, if you ask me, just wonderful. So this is Celia Paul, and I think that she met Freud when she was maybe 18 years old, mm -hmm. and he was maybe 50, I think, or 53, in, in the art school that she went to, uh, the Slade Art School. And um, so I knew of her because I knew she appeared in some of his paintings, and I knew of her because um, I saw her in those paintings. But it's only been recently that I have known of her work, which is really quite impressive. And you should look that up. Next one. Okay, so this, this is um, a woman named Nijet, Nijetka Crosby. And I think her first name is N-J-I-D-E-K-A. And I think it's pronounced Chideka, Chideka Crosby, born in 1983. So um, she is representative of a whole group of very dynamic Black artists working in the United States. These artists have brought a kind of wonderful and new energy to the figurative direction. And what she has done is particularly fascinating. So she both collages images, paints collages, and um, all kinds of variations of that form. <clears throat> I am guessing that the images on the left and right are self-portraits. I almost feel I'm positive of this, but I'm gonna leave a little doubt there, but they're very fresh, very um, contemporary and very involved images. So, and the next one. So this is, this artist is a particular favorite of mine. This is Frida Kahlo. Mm -hmm. And um, these paintings you have to understand are very small. So these paintings are, I would say eight by 10 inches, nine by 12 inches tops. And the paintings are, um, they are connected with a Mexican tradition of an itinerant painter traveling around Mexico and the paintings were done by, the, by this itinerant painter or many of them as offerings to the church. And the paintings were done on tin or metal. And then they would be offered to the church. And I think they're called retablo, retablo, R-E-T-A-B-L-O or maybe retablos, R-E-T-A-B-L-O-S. So here you have in the middle, Frida Kahlo's family tree. And it shows that she descended from uh, a European German and Jewish side to a another side, which is Indian, Indian. And um, on the far right, a very small painting that is in the Museum of Modern Art, which um, is ver a very disturbing painting uh, in which she is seen cutting her hair off. Uh -huh. On the painting on the far left, she's showing you um, painting, she's painting a palette on a palette this is the doctor that she's painting, the doctor who worked with her. And I believe that the painting is, is a palette, but it's also, it indicates part of her viscera, her heart or her insides are being worked on. Um, her paintings are very um, 
uh, very, very striking to me. And I was first became aware of her work, I think in about maybe 1979. And there was a very large show of her work at the Gray Art Gallery at NYU. And I think that show opened her work up to a larger audience. Uh, I saw that show five times. And um, one of the times I brought my daughter to see it, who was um, nine years old. And um, um, so I started off with Frida Kahlo. And then at nine, I went on to, I, I no, I started off with uh, Diane Arbus. And then at nine, I went on to this. And um, uh, it's a funny, a funny education. Um, okay, so that's five. A question or thought about these five from anyone? Um, anyone? So I could just keep going then. I was, uh, Simon, I was just going to comment on the size of the doctor. And I mean, how she's such a small figure compared to the thing, to the guy that she's painting. Yes, What's yes. Significance? Yes, and, and actually that's a very good point because that adds to the quality of surrealism in her work. And I, I would also say, uh, Lucy, the interesting thing about this is that she, when, when I saw her work in 1979, um, the, the major reputation was her husband, who was Diego Rivera. Yeah. He was like the George Washington of Mexican art. And I think at one point, Diego Rivera says that in the long run, she's going to be more well known than he is. And, um, but so she, she starts um, later as a painter. And um, I think her work at its best is um, very, very powerful and um, extremely moving to me. Um, she's been accused of being a narcissist. Uh, uh, th th there probably isn't one bad photograph of her ever. And she, um, would always be dressing, dressing up for the camera, but it was well beyond that. And to that, to that comment about her being a narcissist, I would say that I've met a lot of narcissists in my life and she is the real narcissist. <laughs> She's the real deal. <laughs> um, any other questions or? No, uh, actually. I have a comment, as much an okay narcissist, but I think she's certainly a sensationalist. Yes, yes. Oh, I must, now this is Renee. Yes. So I must say that, that I, I didn't bring this up, but at a certain age, uh, maybe she was about 15 or 16 years old, or maybe even a little younger. She is in a terrible accident. And um, I believe this takes place on a bus yeah, and, and there's a tremendous accident on the bus. She was hit and, by the bus. And her back is incredibly injured. So mm -hmm. over the course of her life, she has many surgeries, even though when you see the photographs, she's extremely striking looking, uh, but she has many surgeries and in many of the photographs, you can see her painting on either casts that she's had or corsets or medical things that she has to wear. Um, uh, can, um, I, uh, can I, I have a comment. I don't know if you're, you're finished. Sure, sure. Um, I, am. I, I, had, I had the pleasure of being in her studio in Mexico 
and yes, the, uh, the, blue, the blue studio the blue studio yeah. yeah and i don't know if anybody else has been there but i i have i have. one has one has the sense that she really was an artistic genius i think i mean just the 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 detail and the way she lived her life and and the the yes. term narcissist i i would challenge it because i think any any great painter could be accused of being a narcissist. They all paint themselves. I, every every yeah, great, yeah. every great painter. Look at Lucian Floyd, Freud there painting himself yeah. naked and, and making right. you know him the center of everything. I yeah. think it's, it's a little bit sexist that people are challenging that she's a narcissist. I think she was really a very very. I mean, I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying that the idea that she would be called narcissistic when she was so ahead of her time, so interesting. Oh yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I just, I thought I was making a joke, you know, like, oh. like that she's the, she's the real narcissist. Others are, are, others are wannabes. This is the real, this is the real thing. Uh, let me, let me, let me, let me. Continue. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Someone else. Carol. Yeah. Um, yes. She also um, had polio as a child. Mm -hmm. I forgot that. I forgot. Yeah. That. yeah. So it was like a double hit. You know? Yes. 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 I think. I, can I just say? Can I just yeah. say quickly? I, I just think if you people thought she was overdressing or trying to look beautiful, wouldn't you be compensating for all the physical damage she had to her body? Yeah. I, I think that's probably what she was doing, covering up. She also, she also painted a lot about her body. Her yeah, paint. she did. Yeah. yeah. I. Um, I, I, I I also think that her dressing up was part of her art. I think she yes. uh, yes. dressing Well, well she... said, well said. That's Rita, Rita, that's really yeah. Yeah. sharp. Um, let me continue and if, we, if you want, we could come back to these, but let me just keep going. So the next one. So um, ah. th this is Keita Kolvitz. <laughs> so it's Keita, K-A-E-T-H-E. Colvitz, K-O-L-L-W-I-T-Z, 1867 to 1945. So um, Colvitz lives through the Second World War. Very this is very, very, very interesting. He lives through the Second World War. She does many, many self-portraits and her mediums are predominantly black and white. She rarely uses color at all. And that's very rare in the history of art that the total production is maybe 97, 98% is black and white. That could be an interesting discussion, another discussion, but it's pretty clear that there are very few. Um, so these are done, these three are done in different mediums. Uh, uh, I think the one on the right is either an etching or pen and ink. The one in the middle is, a, I believe, a lithograph. And the one on the far left might be a lithograph or an etching. Um, she is not as popular or as well known as she should be, this woman. And it's fascinating to, to think about why. Uh, she's, if, if I was teaching a class and I, I said, uh, how many of you students, it, it, let's say it was a class in drawing, drawing or painting, if I would say, let's say there are 20 students and I would say, how many of you know the work of Kate Kolvitz? Um, more than half would not know the work. Really? And of the ones that would know it, I would say out of 20, maybe three or four. And most of the other people, other in students that, take the that would have taken that quotes imaginary class, if they were women, would not know this artist. Hmm. So, in, so in other words, in, in the um, um, return of the importance of women 
and women artists and women in writing and in the arts and so forth, it, it hasn't gone to this person. And there are, there are a number of reasons why, but one of, one of the things that I think of, it, well, well, see, I also feel that this is like major league work, but I think one of the reasons is that her work is extremely serious, not frivolous in any way and not with it or not modish. Uh, and um, I think that most people can't take that in. It's, it's, um, it, it's, um, it's uh, too much for them. Um, uh, Simon? I, I lost my, I lost the, um, the connection. Um, I don't know what to do. I, I have to go back and, and just get this connection back. Just take a second. Um, oh boy. Simon, might it not also be age? How, how so? How so? In terms of older people being more familiar with her work than young people? Uh, yes, I guess, but it, it still doesn't explain it, why she's not part of a resurrection of her reputation. Oh, well, Simon. Um... Yeah. I'm muted. Ah, okay. So, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting you should talk about her reputation because I, I've always thought of her as an extraordinary artist. Um, but in many ways, um, you write that she is actually very unmodish because she was actually coming out of a German tradition that was looking at Rembrandt and Rembrandt etchings. And Rembrandt right now is at a particularly low ebb. Like most people, when they go into the Met, they're not interested in Rembrandt. So there's a particular tonal style that is, it's not bright computer graphic style. It's not illustrational. It's very, yeah, tonal. Yeah, it's very yeah. serious, but, yeah. and she's also an older artist. Uh, a lot of her works are self portraits. She's not yeah. modish. She can't be linked to fashion yeah. and the social yeah. movements and the milieu yeah. that she can be linked to, yeah. which is sort of like death right now is that she was a committed communist. Yes. She was a yes. social radical. So I was actually sort of interested, I was looking at eight books to try to find um, books on her. And actually a significant number of the books on her are actually older books. So right now, unfortunately, her subject matter is um, not one that's very popular. Uh, Simon, it's Lucy. Simon's gone. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Lucy. Go ahead. I was wondering if anybody knows when these pictures were painted or were created. One of them says. Oh, yeah. uh, 1930 something. Five. 1932. <clears throat> and then, but the others don't have a date. I'd be, I'd be very curious to know, especially <laughs> <laughs> her, her work. After, I think she lost her son in World War I, and, and her work reflects that deep, deep misery. That, Do that again. Does anyone remember? A, a, a drawing she did, which seemed to be a mother and child. Yes. In a very it war. Several. In, in war. It, it, I mean, and that has never been a very popular subject. It was yeah. very beautiful. Are, world. Except for the Madonna, of course, but. Um. My, yeah. my knowledge of this goes back to when I was in college, which was in the late 50s and early 60s, I was at Oberlin and I took a class on prints, the history of prints. And she was one of the artists that was studied. 
And it made a big dent on me then, and it still does. Yeah. Um. Can I ask him? <clears throat> What's this? Oh. Hey, Dean. Yes. Oh, Dean, I can't seem to get those pictures back on my screen. The three, is there something that I should do? We all have. Let's see. Um, in other words, I could keep going, but I don't have the pictures in front of me. Most the Zoom screen, they just see, it sees the image of people. I see, I see all of you people, oh. but I don't see the images. The three oh, okay. images. Um, can you? What's your? Do you have the view side by side gallery, or or gallery or some? What's your view? Just the whole page is missing. Oh, um, now now I see it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can you make this bigger? <laughs> what to do? Hit that one. Hit that one. Yeah. Dean, what if he went that offline one. and then just came on again, fresh? Now, wait, wait a minute, Dean. Hey, working. Dean. Yes. What I? Oh no, I see it now. I see it now. But we don't see it together with all the people. No, no, we no. were only seeing this. Oh. That was the whole thing. We're just seeing this. So I see. I see the three images. Mm -hmm. But I see them small. Is oh. there some way, Dean, could, is there some way that I could make it bigger? Simon, I think if you hover over the very top middle of your screen, you'll get view options. And you can play around with those. <coughs> um, something's totally wrong here because the regular, the regular Zoom page is, is missing. All right, it doesn't matter. I'll just go with the smaller images, OK? I don't want to. I don't want to cause any problems here. Uh, if those small images come on, the next grouping come on. I'm fine. It'll just be smaller for me. For, okay. for for the rest of you, it's probably your whole screen. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to keep going. Um, so right. so um, uh, uh, she also um, she goes to art school in Germany. And this is a school for women. It's not a mixed school. The idea of a woman becoming an artist is separated in a way from the general population. Um, she writes very well. She keeps diaries and she writes diaries, uh, diary entries and um, uh, she keeps journals and the diary entries and journals are together in one or two books which show her thought process and um, um, the art, the art is together. So um, I, I would say that she probably has done well over a hundred self-portraits. And oh, and also the other thing is she is involved with sculpture. So she's partially a graphic artist drawing and also involved in sculpture. Her work has another side to it, which is more political and this side to it, which is more internal and personal and more um, uh, moody. And it's this group that I relate to more, but mm -hmm. that's just my take. Um, so let's go to the next one. Okay, so, so this is um, Kerry James Marshall, um, K-E-R-R-Y James Marshall, born 1953. And, um, he is a very energetic um, painter. 
um, very interested in um, the black experience, um, very interested in themes that have to do with being black in the United States, in America. And in this picture on the left, he shows um, his palette, his working materials mm -hmm. and tools. And in the picture on the right, you see a woman painting with a palette. And in the middle, what is has mm -hmm. been described to me as being an extremely small painting, which I believe is him. And um, uh, they're very interesting paintings. And he, like the artist Crosby that I mentioned before, is part of a, a real renaissance of um, black art in the United States. Um, next one. Okay, so this is um, uh, a very interesting artist, one of my favorite artists of this period of time. Oh, also the period of time is from 1900 to 2022. Uh, so this is Edwin Dickinson and Dickinson's dates are 1891 to 1978. Um, so, um, the picture on the painting, <coughs> on the, the painting on the left, the self-portrait on the left is very small. I would say 10 inches high. The painting on the right, is a very interesting painting that was done for the National Academy in New York. So when you became a member of the National Academy, you donated a self-portrait at that time. It's since changed, but at that time you donated a self-portrait. I had the good fortune of meeting Dickinson's daughter, whose name is Helen. And she said to me that when her father was doing this painting on the right, it, the painting was getting better and better. And she said, at one point he looked at her and the other people in his family, he said, this painting is getting too good. It's too good to give to these people. <laughs> and uh, it's a funny statement. Um, so in that painting, he has set up a group of mirrors in which he was able to see himself in profile. Wow. And with this architectural drawing of, uh, I think, a cube in perspective. Mm -hmm. um, his work is very tonal, very moody and tonal. Mm -hmm. And so he's very interested in exploring multiplicity of grays in his painting. And I, his painting is a, a beautiful ideal, which in a sense Mick, uh, Nick spoke about before, in that it is a combination of modern and traditional. And I felt instinctively drawn to his work because of that connection. And um, at, when I was studying at the, the school that I studied at, the Brooklyn Museum Art School, at one point I had the ability or the, uh, I had the, um, the possibility of studying with Edwin Dickinson, who was teaching at the Art Students League. And um, I, I decided to pass on it uh, for one particular reason, which is that many of his <coughs> students, the influence was so strong that many of his students, their work looked like his. Um, he's also a fabulous draftsman. Drawings are incredible. So I would suggest looking him up and there is a fantastic book of drawings that's out of print, but published by the New York Graphic Society. 
So I highly recommend that. Let's see. Let's see the next one. Okay, so these these three I thought to include because they are the studio and they represent the studio of Francis Bacon. And Francis Bacon, English artist, 1909 to 1992. Bacon was a kind of crazy, crazy artist, but super dedicated. And this uh, indicates the way his studio looked. And it's, uh -oh. I don't know, to me, to me, it's, um, a fabulous looking place. Oh my God. And, and in, um, we, Renee and I went on a trip to Vienna and we went to see a particular exhibit in Vienna. I think it was, um, it had to do with Spanish art, but there was, there was a separate exhibit on, which I wasn't aware of, which was called, um, Francis Bacon and the Art of Painting. And it juxtaposed paintings of Francis Bacon with paintings in their collection. So for instance, there's a painting of Francis Bacon of the Pope screaming. And that was juxtaposed, I think, with a painting by Titian of the Pope, okay? So out in the in the hallway, there was a video playing. There was a video playing. And this video was on the theme of Francis Bacon's studio. And it was fantastic. So this is his studio in London. And that studio was moved to a museum in Dublin. So the video, I believe you could find it online. The video shows art historians and maybe archaeologists and a, a group of thoroughly anal people mapping this stuff, <laughs> mapping it maybe. on and on and on, mapping it until, so they had where everything was oh, and there were endless discussions of where all these objects were. And then the whole thing, after spending months or maybe a year on this, the whole thing was sent to Dublin and recreated in Dublin. All this stuff, this garbage and detritus was recreated in London. The video struck me as so incredibly funny, but <laughs> No one else was laughing. It was just, I was just laughing my head off. But in any case, that's Francis Bacon. It um, sort of reminds me a little bit of the Gillespie cocaine. Yes, but, yes, but not Gillespie, but Desiderio. I think it reminds me of Miralago after the FBI went through it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well said. Very, very well tiring. said. Very, very well said. Very yeah. well said. Let's, That's let's, great. Let, let's go on. Let's go on to the next one. Okay, so this is um, this is this is the artist Walter Murch. Oh, okay. So Walter Murch, nineteen oh seven to nineteen sixty seven. 1907 to 1967. So if you look up Walter Murch, you're going to see another Walter Murch, which is a editor, film editor. That Walter Murch is the son of this man. It's a very interesting figurative artist. This is self-portrait in the middle. And the, the paintings to the left and right are um, images of um, machines, or in the case of the one on the left, um, a doll or a mannequin. The images seem to be exploding or um, coming apart. So in his paintings, um, 
he combines uh, an abstract expressionist direction with the figure, with figurative art. I would recommend looking up his work. It's mm -hmm. very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think that he did things to modify the paper or the canvas to make it look aged or um, worn, worn. Um, okay, so that's, oh, one more, the next one, the next one. Okay, so this is Paul Arrigo and Paul Arrigo oh, 19, 1935 to 2022, 1935 <clears throat> to 2022. Um, we discussed Paul Arrigo last term, I believe. And um, so, so she does a number of self-portraits and you can see in the middle her studio and a self-portrait, and then to the left and to the right. Um, very strong drawings, very strong uh, articulation of form, a very willful and um, um, really, really incredibly dense and thick and rich. There is a video on her work which was um, a film or film or video, which was directed by her son. Um, I think his name is Willig, Willig, W-I-L-L-I-G. This is a very, very good video uh, film. And um, it's actually so good that in part, I wondered if it was a film or a documentary. In other words, it almost appears like a French new wave mm. film. It's that good. And um, she mm. is Portuguese, married an English man and lived uh, much of her life in London. Um, so that's five. Uh, any thoughts about these five? Dean, if you could flip to the Dickinson for one second, I just have a question for Simon as to sure, sure, sure. What the the picture on the left? What I'm trying to make sense of what's on the top of his head and what's underneath his his beard. Can can you walk to the side there? Can you yeah, make sense of that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So he he had a fixation on the Civil War, and he dressed up he dressed up at times in Civil War outfits. And I believe that that's what he's doing in this, in this painting. Mm -hmm. But the painting is so, for a small painting, this might be eight by 10 inches or nine by 12 inches. This is so incredibly intense. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, I don't see it now full screen the way you are, but I'm gonna just try to improvise but I know it's very intense. And um, um, he was a very interesting man um, from New England and carried New England in him, but also carried a certain kind of um, avant-garde quality. So it, 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 um, John, you find this interesting that um, um, of all the different non-objective painters who were looking at contemporary art, Dickinson would be the most admired of the non-objective group. Certainly. Isn't that interesting? In other words, if you said to like Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko and that whole uh, direction, which artist do you most admire of contemporary American figurative art? It would be him. It would be him because they saw in his work something, a, a kindred spirit to them. Sure. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah, what would that be? What? What would be the kindred spirit? That, 
that you think that they uh, they felt toward him. Let's say a, an artist like Pollock or Roth, Rothko. Well, I don't think you see it so much in these paintings, but if you looked at other paintings I of see. his, of his, it, you see a way that it's painted so the paint seems to be exploding and the paint is, is the paint for itself as opposed to okay. what you see here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that that would be depend on your curiosity to look this up, and you know when you like Lucy when you're looking up someone like Edwin Dickinson, just punch his name in, and then you'll see below you'll see it will say all, or it will say images. Mm -hmm. If you hit images, you just see a lot of paintings of that artist. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. next next yeah Simon I have a question about one oh. Go ahead. Go ahead, Kara. Oh, yes. I, I, I was just going to say, going back to Carrie James Marshall, there was a, an odd thing I noticed, which is the painting of the woman painting, the one yes. on the right. Yes. The painting she's doing is a paint by numbers. Huh. Huh. You, if you, if you yes, go. Yes, to, yes, I, I, yes, I, I saw that. Yes, Which I think very is, interesting. I, I don't know yes. if that's sexist. I mean that a, the woman would be painting paint by numbers, but it was just very odd. Yeah, yeah, it is odd. But you know, another part that's interesting here is if you look at the Dickinson and you look at this paint, these paintings, these paintings are so flat, okay? They're painted mm -hmm. with such a different idea of painting than, yes. the, Dickens, than the Dickinson is okay so yeah. so you have to think of those aspects are different yes um anyone else um i have no. a point uh, to address carol's point that it, there's a paint by number i see the line drawing of the paint by number it looks like she's painting herself her self portrait in that paint by number because i see yes. the back Hair, the dress, her hair. Yes. So that's kind of an interesting take. Yeah, yeah, it's like a double, a double. Okay. Yeah, you see the chair, the chair is repeated. Right, right. Yeah. Um, let's go on, let's go on to the I, next ha group. I have a question, oh, Simon. Oh, go, go ahead, go About ahead. In the merch, the merch painting, if we can go to his. Yes, could we go to that one? Yes, yes. That, oops, just, you just passed the it. The center yeah. one, yeah. there's an old master painting. I can't put my finger on the name, but the way the angle of the face and so close in the frame. Huh. Um, I've, this refers to another painting. I don't know how I'll figure could out you, which one. I'm you, hoping you, you know. Could you find it? Uh, yeah, Do some research and see. Yeah, it's gonna be could tricky. You... But do, do, do other people see this of the the placement of the head in the frame like that and the peaking effect? Uh, um, Nick, what do you think? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, if you took away that um, cloth, cloth and that was yeah. a fairly typical sort of composition for you might even say like um, Quattrocento Flemish painters, and yeah, then I think. Were... Antw Antoinella, Antoinella, de Antoinella de Messina, yeah, exactly. And but, then I but, think the the cloth covering half the face might be a reference to that famous painting of um, Titian of the Pope, where there is a cloth. Yes, covering. yes, yes. Good point. Good point. Part of him. Um, yeah, that's a good point. This is a very small painting. I w I would say that it's about ten inches high, twelve inches high. Um, it, uh, um, Francis, another point about um, Walter Murch is that <coughs> he worked doing illustrations for scientific magazines, so like Scientific American. And so he did paintings and drawings of machines and apparatus. So then, I don't know how this evolved, but then he, he 
his paintings became a little more risky, <coughs> more avant-garde, but they were still of machines, light bulbs, um, um, uh, the inside of things, and um, they were used by the magazine. Uh, and that's, <coughs> that's how I believe he supported himself. And he would paint at odd hours in the evenings or on the weekend or early in the morning. So he, he, he wasn't independently wealthy. He had to really work to support himself. But in some curious way, if you look at his work, you'll see that the, these illustrations permeated into fine art. And that's fascinating, I think. Another question? <coughs> another question? I, I have one, Simon. I, I can see a comp, a, at least a somewhat common thread through pretty much everyone you've shown us tonight with Yes. Yes. Except that I don't get Matisse as fitting in. So, so, so why are you showing us the Matisse and how does that relate? I think of him as colors well, and form and pretty and, and almost collage and and not about the interior life of people, I guess I would say. So I'm curious, why, why Matisse? So is this John? Sorry, that was David Jones. David, David. Uh, it, yeah, David, I thought it was you or John. Um, so so um, I, your question is a good question. I, I think what connects these is the theme, the artist and the studio. I mean, this is clearly about the, the, the theme. Okay. I mean, it's like unmistakably the artist and the studio but translated through his brain. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, I, I guess it's, it's right. I guess it's sort of, you have to uh, project into his brain from what he's showing you about the studio, I guess, right? He, I mean, he's not, there's well, no auto- Well, the, 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 um, uh, the one in the middle is, you know, has become like almost an iconic work of a studio. So the Museum of Modern Art putting this exhibit on is a very um, audacious move. And um, uh, that's clear. And the one on the left is actually a piece that I've admired for a long time. And it's really a model in a studio. And the one on the right, you can argue, is a still life in a studio. So it struck me that it, it, it separates slightly because of the way they're done, but I think to me, it seems connected. Um, I don't know if you agree or disagree, but that was just my no, I Yeah, I, I can see it, thanks. Yes, I think they, it, has, it certainly has that thematic alignment. I think it, yeah. I yeah. just, I think his style's different and he's less overtly about the figure or the figure of the artist or the yes. interior. Yes, yes, yes. yes. that's, that's def definite. Um, before we continue, I wanted to just ask um, a few of you who, who I haven't heard from, if you have a thought or a question, like Alan, does something occur? Hey, to Simon? You? Yes, uh, Simon, this is Dean. I have something I have to take care of. I'll be back in two minutes. Just to okay. Let you... okay. 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 Alan, do you have a question? Well, about I, you, you know, what struck me, we, we, and actually I, I've been looking at this, this painting, and well, it's actually drawing uh, quite a bit, uh, is the Paul Rico of the woman yes. in the crouch position. Yes. It's, it's just so full of sound, noise, and um, I, it just, I don't know, it just really, um, Got to me, and uh, and I, I wound up staring at it for quite a while. So, so I, I hope I'm here. I hope I'm hearing this correctly. W what you're saying is full of sound. Yeah. Yeah. I I I wouldn't have thought that, but I agree. I agree totally. I agree totally with what you said. 
it's very sharp. Hello? Yeah, yeah, no. Oh, okay. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts, Alan? Um, let me think. Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, I, that's fine. Um, no, not really. I'll, okay, okay. Um, was there someone who, who I haven't heard from? Oh, Lynn, Lynn, what about yourself? Oh, I just had my, my question about um, Dickinson. Nothing in particular, otherwise, Simon, just a wide, enjoying the wide array of um, artists you've chosen. You mean why him? No, 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 uh, no. I just had the one question about Dickinson and the those like the um the dress. That's all. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, uh, is Dean back now? Yes, I'm back. Oh, Thanks. great, great. Let's go on then. Let's go on. So we're doing now. Um, Harvard, Harvard. Okay, so this is uh, my brother, Harvey Dinnerstein. And um, these are three paintings of his. Uh, he has done an, quite a number of self-portraits. Uh, these are three. Uh, the one in the middle is very, very small. I, I mean, small, like three inches high. Oh. Three and a, maybe th four inches, but I would say three and a half inches high. Um, so the one on the left, you see him painting in his studio. And the one on the right, you see him painting the model in his studio. Um, uh, he, his work is very serious. And the painting on the left may or may not be connected to a painting that Rembrandt did where you see an easel in the Rembrandt painting and back at a distance, you see Rembrandt looking at his painting, okay? So I don't know if that's the, the case. And if I did know, if I was gonna, wanted to ask, unfortunately, I can't ask, I can't ask at this point. Uh, my brother uh, passed away in uh, June, uh, he was 94 and um, very committed to his work and led a very committed life. Um, so anyway, so let's go to the next one. Well, uh, oh, that, well, go ahead, go ahead. The picture on the left looks like the picture that he has there below his paintbrush looks like a windmill. Looks like? A windmill. Oh, yes, yes, that's right, that's right, if yes. you wonder what the significance of that is. Yes, it looks like a windmill and the windmill would relate to Rembrandt, I would say. Uh-huh. Uh, yes, that's true. <laughs> um, so the next one is Antonio Lopez Garcia, if you could, yeah. Okay, so, so in, in this case, um, this is a contemporary artist, Antonio Lopez Garcia, born 1936. <clears throat> um, I could talk about his work for the whole evening, but uh, just Dude. quickly, um, uh, very architectural. And I remember reading that when he was a young art student, he may have taken classes in architecture and he won different awards for his work as an architect. Um, the thing that characterizes all three of these to me is the light, uh -huh. a very special kind of light in his work. So the if you saw them in person, the, the light seems to shimmer everywhere, almost to seem like it's iridescent or disintegrating the forms. So the forms in reproduction appear more hard edge than they are in person. The one in the middle 
I always connected with the painting I did of a door of a of a um, bathroom. Okay, and it's I think virtually the same size, um, and the shapes are very interesting in these works. The one on the left is a drawing, and it's a drawing done in graphite, and I believe graphite mixed with alcohol and pencil and pencil. So this would, the one on the left would be like a drawing painting, a drawing painting. The one in the middle is a painting and the one on the far right, I think is a drawing, but it looks like a painting. Uh, there were many examples that I could have chosen of his work, but I, ended up choosing these three because they seemed to relate to the theme and also to relate to um, uh, each other, each other. The three of them are connected with each other. His work to me also connects with um, Edwin Dickinson. I don't know if he even knew of Edwin Dickinson. Dickinson would have been much older I have no idea if he knew him. Um, I had the opportunity to meet this artist once in Spain. He did not speak English and he came to a talk that I gave. And um, he's a very, very interesting man. And all of his work is very interesting. If I was to take out three contemporary artists that are my favorites, he would be clearly one of them. And his the theme in his work is a theme that you will see a bunch of times in this presentation. And it's the same theme of modern and traditional, contemporary and older. Um, uh, the intermingling of that idea, which I see in Edwin Dickinson and in Walter Murch and in this artist. Um, let's Simon, go to the next, let's, Simon. Let's, yes. I have, yes. I, have, I have a kind of the same question, which is there's no self portrait. And is there a studio here? Uh, the studio is in the left one, and I believe in the right one. And I threw in the middle one. I love the middle one. I'm not you know, questioning it. The middle I'm one seemed wondering. to me to be. Part it's of his studio, or like an entrance way to, from his studio to another area, but yeah. I took I took the liberty of doing that. So, you know, right. it's well, it's not like one to one. You know, life right. is life has a little jumpiness to it. <laughs> right. um, let's cool. see the next. Let's see the next one, and we'll come back. We'll come back to you. Let's see the next one. So this is Andrew Wyeth, and Andrew Wyeth. The dates are. 1917 to 2009, 1917 to 2009. Now, since I've already stated this theme that keeps reappearing, this theme is obviously continuing in these three pictures, same exact theme, uh, contemporary, modern, something about the space or the mood and some older aspect. Um, very incredibly well composed. Um, and um, to um, Kathy's question, the last question, and the one I can anticipate is why the picture on the left? Okay. And this is interesting, actually. So what, what Andrew Wyeth did was he had a few friends or a few acquaintances in the area where he lived. And I guess they responded to him strongly and he was given carte blanche to occupy their homes. So he literally had a few studios that were in each of their homes where he did all this work. So his studio was in uh, a man's home. Uh, I think his name was Kerner, another person's home. 
And um, the window was in one of their homes. Hmm. The man on the far right is actually a self-portrait of Wyeth. And that painting is called The Revenant. And it's surprisingly small. It looks to me like a much bigger painting. I think it's about 16 inches high, 17 inches high. And this painting had an unusual way that it came to be is that um, uh, he was in one of these homes and he walked down a flight of stairs and all of a sudden he saw himself at a, in a distance in a mirror. And he, um, I guess he thought of it as a ghost-like existence, right. ghost-like, um, you know, hallucinatory of a ghost. And the painting is called The Revenant, which I believe means a ghost or a visitation. Mm. Um, okay, so the next one, um, David? I mean, uh, I'm sorry, um, Dean, Dean. So the next one is Alice Neal, and you see her painting in the middle. And I added to the left, a painting of Faith Ringgold, who you saw the quilts earlier. So that converses with the quilts. And to the right, um, to the right is a woman who worked for um, Alice Neal and her child. And Alice Neal convinced this woman to pose for her. And then once she started posing, she got her to hold the child and all that. So, so this is the artist in the studio and it's an, a second artist, um, Faith Ringgold. And the picture in the middle is, um, if you pardon the expression, a real pisser. And uh, <laughs> she is something else. She is really something else. It's a very um, daring picture. Right. And um, it makes me think that um, uh, this is something I should try. I, I think I have to get a little older, but I, I, I think it's something I'd like to I'd like to attempt. So um, um, maybe a older fasten, your seat, fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> okay. So any comments on these? Oh, which one is Alice Neal? Is the middle? Is the one in the middle? Uh -huh. Okay. She's the painter. Up. She's the painter, and I believe she was eighty when she did this. Yeah, says Neil eighty, but yeah. Uh, uh, Dean, if you could flip to Harvey for a minute, I just have one comment on Harvey's work. Go ahead. Go ahead. So go back. Yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah. So particularly the uh, the paintings on the left and the right, I I, I think Simon. This this sort of these sort of stand out to me compared to uh, all the other artists in that on the left and the right you really see Harvey is like he's like in action you know yeah. he's like in motion he looks like he's going to you know <coughs> kill something <laughs> here yes. or maybe yes. it's the maybe it's the canvas I don't I don't know but I Good I point. think that the, the energy he's painted himself with is is quite extraordinary and 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 even the self portrait in the in the center you you see a real sort of brooding kind of energy yes. there did, did you ever see him in in action painting and and what did he paint with this sort of energy you see here uh maybe very 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 slightly really slightly but he was um extremely serious so so when he painted and when he drew it was as serious as possible um yes so i did see that um but this has a certain amount of movement especially the one on the right more movement than i remembered um but i think it's an interesting composition because the man is so still mm. and he's so much in movement right, right. um the one in the middle is atypical of his work. Mm. And then he, in other paintings, they're much more social, much more connected with 
movements and civil rights and things like that, mm -hmm. or war, anti-war, and then they come back to something that is different, more private. Um, um, the one in the middle is very early. So it's like 20, 21, 22 years old in the army. Mm -hmm. And um, um, anyway, so, so. Um, Is that him in the, in the center, in yes. the army? Yes, 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 yes. yeah. I, I particularly like that painting. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, I particularly like that painting. And I remember when he was uh, very sick, um, I was speaking about <laughs> this painting with him and I said something, I hope, I hope uh, he could understand what I was saying. I, I said that <clears throat> I thought his abilities changed and became, became better and more with more facility. But there was something about this painting that got to me, this one in the middle. And um, it, maybe it speaks to um, you, you try your best as an artist to get, to have your hand get stronger and stronger, but there might be something else that's maybe more important, the X, the X factor, X. Mm. And that painting has X to me, that one. But it's all personal, so, you know, you know, you can't say it's written in stone. It's just personal. Um, I'd like to go on. So could I continue with um, Dean? Could you continue? I had a, actually had a question. Yeah, OK, about, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. The one on the, uh, the left, the one of Harvey. It looks like that's Whistler's mother on the wall there. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I, that is hard for me to see. On the right, yeah. Yeah. What I'm look what I'm looking at is um, is um, much smaller than yeah. your image. Oh, yeah. My my image, it, it, this is going to sound crazy, but my image is two inches high. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because I can't get I can't get back to the screen once it disappeared, and I don't want to take time away from, you know, taking trying to actually figure this out. So my image is two inches is two inches high, and the area that you're talking about it's like a quarter. Is, is a half an inch in height. But I don't think that's Whistler's mother. Okay. I think that that's a painting of my brother's. Okay, that's my that's my hunch, which I feel quite strongly about. The one in the middle. I know is a painting of my mother. Oh. Okay, that's a definite. And the sculpture is by uh, Luca della Robbia, uh, Italian Renaissance sculptor. And this was a cast, a cast that Harvey got or found, I believe at Vassar College. So that's what that is. If you looked up Luca della Robbia, you would see the original of that. that but that's a cast. Um, I'd like to go on. So uh, I want to make sure I do as much as can, I can. So let's do the next one. OK, so this is um, Jacob Lawrence. This is 1917 to 2000. So Jacob Lawrence, a uh, Black American artist who you could say was very influential on the Black artists that you've seen already tonight. Oh, yeah. And uh, he, he had a, quite a nice reputation in the United States and did a number of series of paintings. So for instance, one series is about migration, Blacks mm -hmm. migrating from the South to the North. 
One was on Harriet Tubman. One was on um, John Brown. One was on Frederick Douglass. And in these, in these images, usually they're kind of small, like nine by 12, 11 by 14 inches. And they become almost like pictures that have to be seen together to create like a storybook or a narrative of a, of a life or a theme. In these three, what I was trying to get at was the way he looked and the way he looked painting, the way he looked in his studio. He was a very striking looking man. And um, so these are three images of himself, self-portrait painting or coming up the stairs into his studio. Um, if I was, if, if I was a contemporary artist today, especially a black artist, I would know his work. It would be very important because he was a real forerunner in terms of American art. Yeah. And um, so let's see the next one. His panel at the Whitney on World War II is very impressive. There's a whole series on World War II in a room by itself at the Whitney. Huh. huh. Uh, and um, yes, yes. Uh, so let's see the next one, um, Dean. Ah, so this is um, Ewan Uglow, 1932 to 2000. So I believe he is maybe English of originally Welsh background. Uh, Unusual name, Ewan, E-U-A-N, E-U-A-N. Uglow, U-G-L-O-W. So you see a self-portrait in the middle and you see uh, his studio and a model or models in his studio. Um, and he worked in a very particular way. He used a lot of measurement and shapes in his work. So if you look up, if you look up his art and you look at other paintings, you'll see um, shards of shapes and forms that form each individual. Mm -hmm. And he left his measuring devices there on the painting. So, so you get a sense of process in his work. And it, even here, you could see this particular theme of modernism and figurative art coming together. So that's very interesting to me. Um, the next one. So these three are uh, drawings of Dawn Clements. Uh, I had the good fortune of meeting her and uh, inviting her over and having dinner with her, really liked her. Um, these are very large pieces. You could see how large the middle one is, uh, which you, you could see the table, you could see the table there. I think that this picture, this drawing is maybe 20 feet wide. Wow. And the one on the left might be 15 feet. She worked on um, paper, that was um, unstretched paper hung on the wall. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how they're um, uh, sold, sold because it would be hard to put these under glass, if you ask me. But um, they are different aspects of her studio. Did and you different spell aspects. her name? I'm sorry. Her, her name is spelled yeah. Dawn. D-A-W-N, D-A-W-N, and second name Clements, C-L-E-M-E-N-T-S. Thank you. Dawn Clements. And um, when, when I met her and when she came over, she was, um, I believe, uh, quite sick. Uh, she didn't like to talk about it. She didn't um, dwell on it. 
but she passed away very soon after. And um, it was very sad. Um, she was very serious, very dedicated. And um, it seemed to me that the touch and the hand of her work is very fine in all three of these, very full of art, very um, involved. Yeah. And I, it looks to me like the, the picture in the middle just kept going on and on. It could have probably, it probably could have been 40 feet wide, but she stopped at a certain point. Uh, and this is pen and ink and maybe brush. Um, so let's see the next one. Did you go? I turned them on. Oh, yeah. Um, Dean? Okay. All right. So this is uh, Jenny Saville. Mm -hmm. So Jenny, J E N N Y, Saville, S A V I L L E. So Jenny Saville, born 1970, uh, English yeah. artist, still alive. Um, very um, adventurous. Um, very full of life, spirited, and um, uh, in a sense, the middle one is quite avant-garde and um, involved in um, the artist, the artist in the studio uh, process, artistic process. Um, let me go one more and then I'll ask you if you have questions. So, okay. So this is one of my favorites. Um, <clears throat> this is Alberto Giacometti. <laughs> so Alberto, A-L-B-E-R-T-O, Giacometti, G-I-A-C-O-M-E-T-T-I. Giacometti, G-I-A-C-O-M-E-T-T-I. So Giacometti, his dates are 1901, to 1966. So um, he's not an artist that I came to immediately or as a student or even a little bit after that. But over many years, his art has become more and more dazzling and more and more interesting to me. And I guess that speaks to also how you change. You change and you see things differently, and you're not the same person. Um, he was a terrific draftsman, drew very well and believed in drawing. So he is also a Renaissance person. He drew, painted, and sculpted. And all, in all three, if you skipped the other two, he would have been a major, major artist. Paintings, major. Sculpture major, drawings major. Uh, he also was very smart, a really deep thinker, a thinker. So a lot of his work has to do with thought, thinking, uncertainty, doubt, a journey, trying to figure something out. Um, the two are on the left are self-portraits. The one on the far right is not a self-portrait, but it's a, it's a piece that was done of a man who posed for him. I think this man's name was Lothar, Lothar, L-O-T-A-R. But this piece to me is so strong that it, it feels to me like this is Giacometti. Mm -hmm. And this is a self-portrait of Giacometti. Mm -hmm. And this is just about one of the last things he did. Uh, it's, I think, terribly moving. Mm -hmm. In one of the classes, I recommended a book and everyone read this book. I don't know if I can do that in this class, but if you wanna look at it, it's a book by James Lord on his posing for a painting of Giacometti. So every time he posed, he took notes and the book is very short. It's about 80 pages long, but it is a brilliant book on the creation of a work of art. Mm. On, the name on, of it? I don't remember the name. Oh, it's called maybe a Giacometti portrait, but it's a book by James Lord 
on posing for a portrait. So now I can't see you, but um, I just want to ask what is your feeling about my continuing with this group? I think one more time should do it. Or yes. 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 I, yes. I would I would love to continue. Yes. But yes. It's up to you. Yes. Yeah, I agree too. Yes. Is that okay? Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so this is a little strange because I can't see you. But I, I must tell you, even though I can't see you for the past hour, I love doing this. <laughs> this is so much fun. It's so uh, uh, exhilarating and terrific. I can only hope that you're enjoying it. <laughs> yes, it's very, very I, can, I can't see any of you. I can't see any of you. I can only see these three pictures. The little picture of Giacometti on the far right is about one and a half inches high. So um, yes, I please. will I will see you I will see you next week. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. So Good night. thanks. Take take it easy. I'll see you next week. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> really crazy. <laughs> Gotta be, able, gotta be able to improvise in life. <laughs>